7 ways Final Fantasy games are connected. How can we relate the universes of worlds that seem so far apart? That's a question that's been lingering for as long as the series existed. And there have been many theories trying to show evidence that, in a more or less convoluted fashion, Final Fantasy games were interconnected. Let's see how we can sum them up. Lady ho to you, fair little mongo. With the expected release of a new entry in the series, I wanted to review the different ways Final Fantasy games are interconnected. There's already a few analogies that we can make from what we know of Final Fantasy XVI, whether that be the blight consuming the lands and reminiscing of the Star Scourge, or the political context of the world, and some other things. Oh, not you again. But what about the rest? What can we expect from Final Fantasy XVI? Summons make up for the first category we'll look into in this video. They were introduced in the third installment and have since appeared more regularly than any of the other categories we'll discuss in a moment. We can never be certain of their origin, but they have a significant role in many titles, even Belial to say the least. Most especially in Final Fantasy VI as Espers, Final Fantasy VIII as Guardian Forces, or Final Fantasy X thanks to Yuna, you know. In Final Fantasy XIII, they are related to a particular character. Whereas in Final Fantasy XII, you may choose who's gonna be able to summon what, like Final Fantasy VIII with the junction system. Final Fantasy XI is yet another interesting case. A week in Venadil comprises eight days, and each day refers to a particular summon. Summons that quite recently reappeared in Rhapsodies of Vanadil, in one of the best cutscenes I've seen in that game. But summons are not the only entities to hold some kind of connection between the games. Contrary to the Mughals, Chocobos have had a consistent appearance since they first appeared in the second installment. Funny that they weren't supposed to look like that to begin with. Chocobos are present in a majority of Final Fantasy games. How come they always look the same? I wonder. So maybe we'll get to see some of those one day in the future. The Mughals have been another recurring characteristic within the Final Fantasy universe. Putting aside some of their most dubious appearances, wink wink Final Fantasy XII, they are more interesting than Chocobos, in the sense that they have the ability to talk, it's a shame they have nothing to say. They barely allude to the possibility of a multiverse, but if we were to find a connection in these games, then maybe we should keep an eye on them. I was making fun of their appearance in Final Fantasy XII earlier. Well, I think that might be the most organized form of Mughal society I've ever seen in the multiverse. They've got access to powerful technology. No, not that kind of technology though. And I mean the game says they build the first airship, in Nivalis, then a masterpiece of technology called Advancement. In Final Fantasy XIV, you even get to fight a Mughal king, in case you didn't know. But there's nothing special to know except always start by killing the Black Mage then the white mage, then the bard, then the ranger, then the thief, then the paladin, then the... Okay, I was clearly infringing on a memo territory in the previous section. I mean they're the only main Final Fantasy titles with worlds that look astonishingly alike. They have cat people, potatoes, people with long ears, potatoes, and those guys. They share some common physical characteristics, don't they? Final Fantasy XIV is obviously the most significant of the two. I'm not going to spoil a f***ing good story, so I just say that the world of Eorzea is not the only one to exist, and that's the most consistent and explicit illusion we've had in a Final Fantasy game so far. And what you're watching at the moment is footage of a cat girl from Eorzea in Final Fantasy XV. A crossover quest that was added to the game in an update. She doesn't say anything really meaningful about the possibility of a multiverse, but she comes with a fat chocobo, and that's extremely hilarious. Final Fantasy XI is not really into the multiverse. Most of the stories are focused on the world of Anadil, and regularly involves an entity known as the Void, probably the only window we have in this game onto a possible multiverse. But I need to introduce next point before I can go further in my theory. 
Now, I don't think Garland from Final Fantasy IX is the same Garland as from Final Fantasy. So easily defeated! Nor is Ayn, the fashionable skeleton slash magician from Final Fantasy III. The same Ayn as the deity that created the world of Final Fantasy VIII, in my humble opinion. I think that with just Final Fantasy IX paying homage to the saga, and that it with just Final Fantasy VIII uh, being Final Fantasy VIII, I suppose, sometimes entities from different games just reappear for no particular reason, except for gameplay reasons. Though they remain similar in terms of function, why they exist in other words, I'm not so sure that they're always the same quote-unquote characters. Take the Cloud of Darkness, if that's possible. They appear in several Final Fantasy games, and they look much alike. Save one exception. Final Fantasy XI. Even if they're not the same characters, they have the same function. However, there is one exception. Gilgamesh. He was sent to the Rift in Final Fantasy V and reappeared a few games later. And in the original script of Final Fantasy VIII, he was supposed to mention Baals, Final Fantasy V's main protagonist. I always found amusing that there were so many common points between V and VIII. And in many games, he refers explicitly to his ability to traverse different worlds. But we don't know much because, you know, this is Gilgamesh. The guy likes the sound of his voice. The Void in Final Fantasy XI might be the same location as the Rift, though it's not stated explicitly. Omega is another interesting case. You meet it in the Rift, like Gilgamesh, so it comes as no surprise it should appear in other games, right? For example, you fight it in Final Fantasy XI, and it looks a lot like the original one. And though it's true that Omega has had no consistent appearance, you can find it in many Final Fantasy games, as a boss or a super boss. Same for Ultima Weapon. I have a theory about it, but that's my final point, so we got a few other things to consider before we actually get there. I was mentioning the crossover between Final Fantasy XIV and Final Fantasy XV earlier, some of the most recent entries in the series. But what about the meta-series? Are there any notable crossovers significant enough to appear in this video? Uh, let me think. Of course, let's talk about Final Fantasy XIII. Well, not exactly. You guys probably know about the Fabula Nova Crystallis universe, a project that was supposed to compile many games set in the world of Final Fantasy XIII. When Final Fantasy vs. XIII became Final Fantasy XV, they had to remove a lot of content from the original concept, so that XV would be something more than just the Final Fantasy XIII reject, which is one of the worst insults you will ever hear in your life. <coughs> let's not beat around the bush any further, and let's talk about Kingdom Hearts. Yay! The first meta reference to vs. XIII took the form of a trailer for a video game that plays at the beginning of the Toy Story world, in the third installment. The toys hilariously confuse protagonist Sora for the main character of the game within the game, Yozora, who bears a strong resemblance to Noctis' original look. The Remind DLC went a bit further and included an almost shot-for-shot -shot reproduction of a trailer for Vs. 13. Was it just an attempt to bring more elements of Vs. 13 into the Kingdom Hearts franchise, or do they really plan in the future to kind of emphasize the idea of a multiverse in Final Fantasy games? I mean, crossovers are a staple in Final Fantasy XIV, and many of the series' staple boss enemies actually appear. Whether that's part of the lore, or just some fan service, I'll let you decide. So we discussed the meta series. What about spin off titles? I'd be mainly focusing on Dissidia. I mean, it was something of a dream game on paper. It combined some of the series' most popular heroes and villains in a battle between Chaos and Cosmos. The warriors from both sides are summoned through various gateways that are basically portals connecting every single world to the rifts and other realms. A theme we know is always present in the two MMOs. It is the same rift or void that Gilgamesh has traveled through to enter different Final Fantasy worlds at various times in the series, and the explanation for where bosses like Necron and Cloud of Darkness originate. Arakawa, Nomura and Kitasei all of them three confirmed that this story is canonical to the entire series, confirming once again that there's a connection between all of Final Fantasy's different worlds and universes. Or, I have another theory. This is just a marketing choice to sell their products. Selling video games is a business, guys, not leisure. That's why we have First Soldier. World of Final Fantasy is another game I would put in this category. The story's events are set in the world of Grimoire a land where multiple locations from early or Final Fantasy games appear, such as Cornelia and Saronia. Countless heroes of the main series have appeared, and to some extent they retain their original personality and traits, 
plus their skill damage. Okay, before we move on to my last point, I got a few highlights I'd like to mention very quickly. What if Genova was Lincey, the deity that created Forsy Cocoon in Final Fantasy XIII? Or maybe the Fallen Queen of Lucis? After all, the Star Scourge bears a strong resemblance to Geostigma, doesn't it? What if the Far Plane was also the Promised Land? And what about Shinra? How can he be related to all the other Final Fantasy games? You know, sometimes locations have the same name, and yet they have little connection. Like Costa del Sol in Final Fantasy VII and XIV. The same can be said for towns like Mysidia and Palamecia, or the world of Ivalis. Final Fantasy Tactics, The War of the Lions, and Revenant Wings, they all took place in Ivalis, the world of Final Fantasy XII. For Vagrant Story, on the other hand, it's more difficult to create a true link. In 2004, the game director said that it was connected to Final Fantasy XII, but in 2010 he said the world of Vagrant Story was independent from Ivalis. The words it shows are important though, and the two are not contradictory in my opinion. The Ring of the Lusai and the Train Theme wow. Final Fantasy was the saga that told you surplexing a train was actually a thing. And the train motif has appeared accordingly in a few Final Fantasy games. Which is perfect for me to introduce my last point. How can you sum up the metagame in Final Fantasy? Thing is, there's more than just one definition. It could be that there's always a game within the game. I'm not going to list them all, but if you go back to the first installment, there was this minigame you could play on the boats. Final Fantasy VII and X-2 have a lot of stuff like this. But you could also mention Triple Triad in Final Fantasy VIII and Final Fantasy XIV. But this is not exactly what I meant by metagame. Note how the gameplay usually reflects the universe and the story. The Crystarium, for example. The further progress you make in the story, the further your characters develop going down a linear path that reflects how close they are to fulfilling their focus. The same can be said about Final Fantasy II. The gameplay reflects the evolution of the characters. There's a kind of reciprocity in there. And you could argue the same for FF8 and the junction system, or the magicites, materia and spheres of 6, 7 and 10. Once again, the gameplay reflects the lore. See how the job system in 3 and 5 is always related to a crystal? Crystals give you the ability to pick new jobs and continue to grow in strength. Crystals, now that's a recurring theme. I believe that's the kind of game design decisions which have been a recurring motif in Final Fantasy games. Thank you for watching this video, don't forget to leave an impression, a good one if you can. You may also subscribe to my channel if you want more Final Fantasy content. And see you next time for a new exciting episode of Chocobo in Space. There once was a ship that put to sea, and the name of the ship was the Belly of Tea. The winds blew hard, her bowed it down, oh blow me, bully boys blow. Soon may the wellerman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tonguing is done, we'll take our leave and go. May the wellerman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tonguing is done, we'll take our leave and go.